Okay, so good morning. My name is Chaim Angel. I'm the National Scholar for the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. I want to thank the Institute for really promoting such a, an intelligent Judaism throughout the country and far beyond. Rabbi Mark Angel, my, my father, but also the, our founder and director, has really made such a huge impact throughout his 50 plus years in the rabbinate, but particularly in the Institute since 2007. We've really been able to do so much, and so thank you for making this all possible. I also want to thank uh, Rabbi Shaul Robinson and Lincoln Square Synagogue for hosting this, hosting this event. We've had several symposia and other events here, and of course, every time I walk into this room, it just brings back a lot, a flood of fond memories of learning. I learned, I was you know, on that part of the room over there facing this way, uh, but all the same, a weekly class for, for years in here. So it, it's really, and it's good to see some of the chevra, our learning chevra from that here as well. Uh, so I wrote a book on Sefer Tehillim, and the goal of this is just to quickly give a mini shiur. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a book reception rather than a full-blown course. Uh, my nephew Jake, who's now 23 years old, uh, when he was seven, he and I were chatting about baseball, of course, and we were just this and that and the other thing about this and that player. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he said, Uncle, uh, the words of the Chumash matter. It matters what they mean. But the words of our prayers, it doesn't matter what they mean. That was just, it came out of nowhere. I wasn't asking him about his education. I wasn't asking him anything. We were chatting baseball. Uh, but all the same, he just blurted that out. And it really had a, made a huge impact on me because, of course, he was right. He was simply reflecting what your standard second grader in just about any yeshiva day school experiences. They didn't tell him in school the words don't matter. But what they did is they taught him how to pray and how to read the prayers without explaining what do they mean. Whereas in Chumash, from Torah, from the very beginning, they dissected words and they had vocabulary lists, and they actually did spend time trying to understand the meaning of the words. That had a huge impact on me. It really was the sense of, oh my goodness, what can we do to correct this? And obviously the book of Tehillim is something that uh, is a, an important vehicle to this. It's a way of getting to understand, here are words that we say daily, sometimes weekly, sometimes once in a while, sometimes pretty much never, unless you are a Psalms reader and you actually go through liturgically once a month or whatever it is. Uh, it's, it's, it, but it's an amazing book and it's, it's quite varied. And then, so that conversation with Jake triggered a memory that I have from when I was 18 before there was any, before I was an uncle uh, at all. And that is when I was 18 years old and I studied Tehillim for the first time. I was a first year yeshiva student at Yeshiva Kotel. And I wasn't really interested in the things that they were learning in the yeshiva at all. But I was a good boy. I wasn't one of those troublemakers who was doing all kinds of terrible things. I was at Yeshiva Kotel, so if you know Rav Bina's, uh, what he did to troublemakers, I wasn't on his hit list. That was good. So he left me alone because I was a good boy. And so I figured I should do something while I'm here for a year, other than just goof off. And so I opened up a Tehillim. I said, you know, I say this every day. I have no clue what I'm saying, because I had the same experience that, that so many do. And I was blown away immediately. It wasn't a class, it wasn't some charismatic teacher, it was simply reading the Hebrew words with the translation and some commentary. That was it. I'm like, this is an amazing book. Here are a series of authors, what did I know about authorship then? But a series of authors, divinely inspired, who are completely intoxicated with God, passionate, unbelievably honest with God. I and mean, I couldn't get over, wow. Nobody ever taught us to pray like that. It, it, was, it was actually a sensational, sensational experience. And so since then, I've had a personal connection to the Book of Psalms, and one which I teach in college courses at Yeshiva University and many adult education uh, forums. And the goal of this book, basically, it's not a comprehensive commentary. It really is a companion volume. It's a series of essays trying to pinpoint a few of the main themes, a few of the main disputes among our commentators, some of the key psalms that we recite all the time, some of the ones that we never recite, and just try to get exposure to, here are some things that you will encounter when you learn the book of Tehillim. Now go out there and learn the rest of it on your own, however you wish to do so. And, that, and that's up to the reader, obviously. Uh, so what I thought I would do for the book reception is the most common and popular of, of all 150 psalms, namely Psalm 145, what we call colloquially the Ash. Ashrei. I remember how traumatized I was when I learned that the verses Ashrei are not part of the psalm. Because, you know, we just learned it in school, so we recited it. Nobody told us, oh, these two verses are added from two totally different psalms, and then this verse at the end is inserted from a third psalm. It was just in the prayer book that we had with big font, because it was an important psalm, apparently, and we learned it when I was very, very young. 
Uh, but nobody told me that there were different verses from different places. So I wanted to spend a little time with you going through it. Now, the source sheets, you have two pages, meaning two sheets of paper, right? One is the additional sources, and one is the actual psalm, and, he, and everything is in Hebrew and in English. So I'm going to start with, with source number one in the front, but we will then go over to the then go over to the psalm itself to spend a little while just going through some of the major ideas that, are, that you will find when you come there. So in Brachot 4b, I have the Hebrew and the English. I will read the English, but you have the Hebrew in front of you as well. Rabbi Elazar Baravina says, Whoever recites the psalm of David three times daily is sure to inherit the world to come. That is a great ticket to heaven. It's so easy, and I'll, I'll tell you a secret. This is, not the, uh, this is not the original text of the Talmud. The original text of the Talmud is whoever recites this psalm daily, one time, okay, don't tell anybody, uh, but it's actually the original text, Rav Amram Gaon quotes it that way, the original text was just one time daily, and so in the Gaonic period, the rabbis felt, okay, we want to increase the odds of more Jews saying this at least once daily, and so that's, that's where the three times a day comes in. They simply wanted to increase our chances of doing it once, and then eventually that practice crept into the text of the Talmud itself. That's, how, that's the story of that particular line. Uh, but it comes from the second verse of the Ashrei, right? Bechol yom avarecheka. Right? Every day I shall praise you. Balalashimcha, and I will praise you, le'olam va'ed, which literally can mean for all eternity. So the rabbis here are darshaning, they're making a midrash on that second pasuk of the Ashrei, what we call the Ashrei of Tehillah le David, uh, that if you bless God and every day by saying this psalm, you too can praise God forever, le'olam va'ed, which should include some share in the world to come. So this is a real easy ticket. So you have to understand why the sages thought that this was such an important psalm that we have to recite it daily and then it became the practice to do it three times daily twice in shacharit and one more time at mincha so what is the reason what makes it so special shall i say it is because it has an alphabetical arrangement you know that it starts off with one verse with aleph then bet then gimel we call it an acrostic yeah there's no nun we'll talk you can read more about the no nun thing in the book I'm not going to talk about it today, but, in, but it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question why there is no nun. The real answer, by the way, that I can give you in short form. I have no clue. I just know that there is, I, there is no nun and that there is no, there is no reason provided anywhere in our tradition. That Radak and other commentators simply say, we don't know. It's good enough for me. But there's more to say about it. You can read about that in the book. Uh, what I care about here is that the acrostic was understood to be special. The idea is that we're praising God from Aleph to Tav or from A to Z. That there is a comprehensiveness to an acrostic psalm, and that's what we get out of doing it this way. All right, so if it's because it's an acrostic, that's cool, but wait a second. We have the great granddaddy of them all acrostic in Psalm 119, where it's eight olives and then eight bets and eight gimels and so on, so that there's a whopping 176 verses in the psalm. I think my math is right. And in the meantime, eight times 22, and so you can look that one up on your own. And so that by far the longest chapter in all of the Bible, and it's eight times the acrostic. So if you want an acrostic to make it special, so say that one every day. Let them then recite, happy are they that are upright in the way, which refers to Psalm 119, which has an eightfold alphabetical arrangement. So that can't be it. Again, is it because it contains the verse, you open your hand and satisfy every living thing with favor? Let him recite the great Hallel, where it is written, who gives food to all flesh. So the key verse, which many Sidurim have little instructions about having extra intentions even now, is poteach et yadecha that God gives us daily sustenance. Well, the rabbis obviously saw this verse as critical to what makes great praise. It's not about, wow, you split the sea, or you created the cosmos. Those are good, but not as good as people just making a living. The day-to-day -day religious life is much more important to the rabbis than the great big things that happen either once in forever or at least once in a very long time. And this passage is simply reflecting that philosophy. So if it's just about day-to-day -day sustenance, though, there are other psalms that also include praise of God for day-to-day -day sustenance. That's not enough either. Rather, the reason is because it contains both. Aha, it has the acrostic and talks about daily sustenance. Now we're talking. All right, so that's great. And so that's at least a start for how the rabbis see this as a very, very special psalm. But I'll tell you something. There's, there's definitely more. Besides the A to Z thing and besides the uh, prayer for gratitude for day-to-day for -day sustenance, there are other things. There's something called a literary inclusio, which is just 
by the way, never type this because my auto spell correct always changes inclusio to inclusion because they don't know the word inclusio. It doesn't matter how many times I put it in my notes, it always ends up wrong. And so I, it, what can I do? Inclusion is a nice word too, but it's just not the word I'm trying to do. Inclusio, the Hebrew expression is chatima me'en apetiha. It means that if a psalm or any literary unit really begins and ends with either the same word or similar expressions, that's considered a literary inclusio and there's also a sign of a complete unit. So for example, if you flip to the back page now where you actually have the psalm in Hebrew, it works better in Hebrew for this one, but you have the English if you'd like to look at that as well. We start the psalm, Tehillah le David, a praise of, of David. And if you go to the bottom verse, Tehillat Adonai Yedaber Pi, it begins and ends with the word Tehillah. Fun fact, in the whole book of Psalms, there are 150 chapters, at least the way that we divide the text in the Misorah, in, in our classic medieval tradition from Tiberia. There's only, and we call the book Sefer Tehillim. So I would expect that a whole pile of psalms would begin Tehillah something. So the answer, the answer is this is the only one. This is the only psalm out of 150 that begins Tehillah. There are a whopping 57 that have the word Mizmor, but we don't call it the book of Mizmorim. In fact, the sages refer to each unit as a Mizmor, but the book is called Tehillim. So it's one Mizmor, the book of Tehillim. Go figure. Uh, but uh, a leading theory out there is that the book is called Tehillim because of our psalm. It is so grand and important in our tradition that that got the top billing for the name of the book, even though Ms. Moore clearly is the most important uh, introductory expression in Sefer Tehillim. Okay, so you have Tehillah le David and you have Tehillah Adonai Yedaber P. Keep going. Tehillah le David on, in verse 1 again, Pasuk Aleph. Tehillah le David, Arumimcha Elohai Melech, Vavarcha Shimcha Leolam Vaed. I shall bless you for all time, forever, right? Go back down to verse 21, the bottom one, Kaf Aleph. Tilat Adonai Yedaber Pi, Vivarech Kol Basar, Shem Kocho Leolam Vaed. Okay, so this is what we call a literary inclusio, that we have the Tilat at the beginning and the end, we have the blessing God at the beginning and the end. So besides the acrostic, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, etc., you also have this literary inclusio. But wait, there's more. I didn't know this, even though I say this psalm, I'm, I'm, I'm heaven bound here, I say this psalm three times every single day. Okay, so I should know it pretty well, right? Forget it. Anybody who prays, especially prayers that you know really well, knows how hard it is to actually think about them. I can, I can rattle it off, right? But, it, but that's not the same thing as actually praying. So I didn't realize this, even though I say it all the time, uh, until I read an article about it when I was, right, when I was preparing you know, the original shiurim, the original lectures that would become the basis for this book. Uh, the word kol, which means all, like the kaf lamed one, appears a lot of times in this psalm. In fact, it appears a whopping 17 times. But I, I only noticed that because I read this article. And now, OK, so now I pay more attention. But it's amazing. If you just start from, for example, from, from verse 8, you know, just right over there. Pasuchet. Chanum v'rachum Adonai erach hapayim v'ugdol chasad. Tov Adonai l'akol v'rachamav al kol ma'asav. Yedu Adonai kol ma'asecha v'chasidecha y'varachucha. Kumo v'archa y'omer v'archa y'daberu. Le'odiya l'vnei adam k'vro tov v'chavar adam l'achutam l'achutam l'achut. Kol olamim. Sh'altacha b'chol dor v'ador. So mech Adonai l'chol anofalim v'zokef l'chol l'akivofim. Wow! That's a lot of kols. So even though I never noticed it, saying this three times a day, which is a little disturbing, but all the same, sometimes prayer does work that way when you're, when you're, when you're habituated to it, uh, learning about it is really handy, because suddenly you realize, wow, the acrostic, okay, that I knew since I was a little kid. Inclusio, I had no clue what that was until much later in the game, but that's a good way to show comprehensive praise. The fact that the word coal or all keeps on showing up, obviously, uh, is very important. So the idea is here you have a psalm of pure praise. There's no petition. You're not asking God of, for anything here. There's an absolute psalm of pure praise. And you're praising God for all kinds of things and a lot of alls in a comprehensive way from Aleph to Taf. Well, if you actually mean that, you definitely deserve your share in the world to come. Right? In other words, the, the idea that this became of paramount importance to our sages because this is what it, if you really mean this psalm and are able to say it, not just by reciting it, but by actually meaning it, uh, there's a pretty good religious impulse indeed. Our later Geonic tradition in the, in the medieval period one-upped how comprehensive this psalm is by adding those verses at the beginning of the end. And, and the end, you know, we have Ashrei Yoshevei Beitecha, Odiya Lelucha Sela. That's taken from Psalm 84. Ashrei Am Shekach Allah, Ashrei Am Shadonai Elohav. That's the immediate verse preceding this psalm in the book of Tehillim. 
And then at the end, you have, hallelujah. that's plucked from a, a verse that we call the Hallel now, in Psalm 115. Okay, those are sources, I hope, 2, 3, and 4, but try, take my word for it if you want to. Otherwise, you can just look at them. What matters is, the very first word in the entire book of Psalms is Ashrei. And the very last word in the book of Psalms is Hallelujah. So by adding these verses at the beginning and the end, what the Geonim did is they made this psalm into a super psalm. Wow. Now, that was a really cool change in lighting. Did you notice that too? Uh, that was really, I love that kind of stuff. In the meantime, uh, getting back to the main topic at hand. Yeah, so it's a, really good, it's a really good super psalm situation where you have, wow, we wish we could praise God as comprehensively as possible, but okay, we have other things to do during the day. We can't just recite psalms. Right? So okay, so the way that we manage that is we... Create a, we have a psalm that's already so comprehensive, and then we say it's as though we're reciting the entire book of Psalms in this one psalm. It's really, really neat. Okay, so I think that that's already enough said. That's great. Uh, there's a wonderful article published by a rabbi. His name is Aviyah Cohen. He wrote a, a little booklet on Sefer Tehillim. It's called Tefillah El Chai. He published it in 2007. And he gave a really interesting analysis, if you just look at the back page still, where you have the psalm. I broke it up in accordance with his way of reading the psalm. He actually, or, he actually offers three different readings of the psalm, but this is the one I found persuasive, so this is the one I'll present to you. You can read his book for his other, for his other two. He notices that within the psalm, that, the psalm 145, there are two things that the psalm does. One is kriya lahalel, where he, he doesn't actually praise God. He says, I want to praise God or you should praise God, or we will all praise God, something like that, but we're not actually praising anybody, we're just talking about it, right? And then there's the praise stuff, where we actually say very powerfully wonderful things about God. So it alternates, it starts off kriya lahalel, right? I will praise God forever and ever. I will bless God. Right? So he didn't bless God at all. He's just saying that he's going to. Okay, then Pasuk Gimel, verse 3, God is very great. In fact, his, his, his greatness is, is infinite. Okay, that's a praise. Okay, then zing. You know, every generation will bless God. So here's the transition that Rabbi HaKohen observes here. It started off with who's doing the praising or who's doing the call to pray, who's, who's being called to praise in verses one and two. I am. Right? It was a singular. I will praise God. Good. Uh, now in this middle paragraph over here, who's that? Plural. Okay. is singular. So it's I and the community. Plural, singular. So here, the individual prayer, by the way, yet another flaw of English. I mean, try teaching your kids how to spell words, and it's enough to go crazy, right? Uh, but in the meantime, we have this issue, and I'm sure that I had it as a kid also. Uh, but in the meantime, another real big bummer in, in our context is the word for somebody who prays. See, I should be able to say somebody who prays is a prayer. But I can't do that because the thing that you're saying is al already got that one, right? Like in Hebrew, it's very simple. There's the tefillah, there's the prayer, and there's the mitpalel, the one who prays. But you don't want to say the one who prays because that's very clunky. So what you do here is you have to say pray hyphen er. So, but when you're speaking, that's really hard. So I have to go pray er, and then I have to give a whole paragraph of words to explain what I'm doing. Okay, so it takes a lot more time this way, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. In the meantime, what can I do? So the prayer, the one who is praying, is joining the community in this middle section over here, okay? Then we have more praise. So here you have praise of God, that he's amazing, he's very compassionate, he's good to everybody. Then we go back to the third call to praise. Everybody should praise God. His right, his pious one should praise him. Singular, plural, or both? It's all plural. So the, the movement of the psalm, even though it's all called to praise and praise, is different. First time it's just the individual. Then 
you move up where you start acknowledging, hey, there's a community of, of prayers around me. And then you just become part, absorbed into the community. Right? You suddenly become at one with the entire community of people who are praying. Then if you go down to the very, very end, Tilat Arunai Yedaber Pi Vivarek Kol Basar Shengoshol Leolam Vaed. So at the end he says that my mouth should sing the praises of God, and all flesh, all humans should praise God. So you never lose your individuality. Right? Even though you've gone from individual to some individual, some plural, to totally absorbed in the community, each individual prayer is his or her own self. And so even though you're already by now looking to all of humanity, it doesn't matter. You're still very much, you're still very much, your voice still contributes to the broader thing. And as a bonus, uh, at the beginning of the psalm, uh, verse 1 again, I will, bless, I will bless God's name forever. In the last verse, in Kaf Aleph, Tilat Vivarech Kol Basar Shem Kod Show. Even though it's a literary inclusio, it just says Shimcha, your name, in verse 1. But in verse 21, it says your holy name. And Rabbi HaKohen says that's what happens when you join the community. We even have a halachic term for this. It's called Devarim Shabikidusha. There are certain prayers that are considered so holy, so sacred, that you require a community to say them. You're not allowed to say them on your own. So the idea is, as the individual is praising God and joining the community, now you can sanctify God's name. And that's really what, what communal prayer is all about. So I thought that was great, so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, one last point for the day. If you go to, uh, we have every morning, we say this psalm kicks off the series of hallelujahs in our, in our morning liturgy. We say the last six psalms of Tehillim, 145 through uh, 150. So there are two themes that are both central to what Jewish life and Jewish thought really are all about. Uh, one is particularism, that B'nai Israel, the Jews, have a singular covenant with God through our history and then, of course, through the revelation at Sinai. And then there's universaliz universalism, which is that we are part of a humanity. And that God created, God is everybody's God, and we are very much linked to the world in every possible way. Those are both themes within our tradition. In Tehillah David, again, you could read it on your own, or you could trust me, or you could just pay attention to this when you pray. It is a purely universalistic prayer. There is nothing specific about the God-Israel relationship. There's nothing about being Jewish in that psalm. Tov Adonai Lakol, God is good to all creations. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Judaism. It's that all God-fearing people should bless God, because that's, that's what we should do. We are very grateful to God for all that God gives us. So that's Psalm 145. That's the first of the litany of psalms that we say in our morning prayers. Now if you go to source number 5, back on page 1, let's just see what those other psalms do. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Hallelujah. This already sounds more Israel-centered, right? That this is more of the particularistic side, that we have the God of Jacob, even though God of Jacob belongs to everybody. Uh, still, that's a very specific term to the people of Israel. And likewise, the mention of Zion or Zion or Jerusalem, likewise triggers some Israel centricity, which is fine. That's another pole within our tradition. Psalm 147, on source 6, it's much more so. Hallelujah, it is good to chant hymns to our God. It is pleasant to sing glorious praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers in the exiles of Israel. This is about the God-Israel relationship. It's not a universal, universalistic psalm at all. He issued his commands to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He did not do so for any other nation. Of such rules they know nothing. Hallelujah. Okay, so that psalm very much sets up a contrast. We got the Torah, nobody else did. Okay, so that's Real particularism at its finest. That doesn't mean that there are no universalistic themes within the psalm, but I'm highlighting the fact that there are s several verses that are clearly particularistic. Psalm 148 is actually the biggest fake out of this litany that we say every morning. Uh, source 7. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him on high. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all bright stars. This sounds very universalistic, right? We have God, the angelic host, the creation, all the way down. But then toward the end, it changes gears a little. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name, his alone, is sublime. His splendor covers heaven and earth. He has exalted the horn of his people for the glory of all his faithful ones, Israel, the people close to him. Hallelujah. That last verse really doesn't match the whole rest of the psalm. It suddenly t jumps out of nowhere and takes a very universalistic praise of God as the creator and turns it into an Israel-centered psalm, or at least with a strong Israel particularistic theme. 
Uh, source 8, Psalm 149. Hallelujah. This is, a very, this is a very particularistic psalm, perhaps the most of the bunch. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praises in the congregation of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in its maker. Let the children of Zion exult in their king. So it's all about us, right? <laughs> Let them praise his name and dance with timbrel and lyre. Let them chant his praises. For the Lord delights in his people. He adorns the lowly with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them shout for joy upon their couches. With peons to God in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to impose retribution upon the nations, punishment upon upon the peoples, binding their kings with shackles, their nobles with chains of iron, executing the doom decreed against them. This is the glory of all his faithful. Hallelujah. This clearly is a prayer for the destruction of Israel's enemies. Okay, so this very much focuses on the God-Israel relationship. Okay, so we started off universalistic, then we have four psalms in the middle there, largely particularistic, although of course there are universalistic themes. Finally, the last one, Psalm 150, source 9. Hallelujah, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the sky, his stronghold. Praise him for his mighty acts, praise him for his exceeding greatness. Praise him with blasts of the horn, praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dance, praise him with lute and pipe. Praise him with resounding cymbals, praise him with uh, loud clashing cymbals. Let all that breathes praise the Lord, hallelujah. It's as universalistic as they go. Right? That's great that within our daily prayers, we make sure to hit upon these two poles and very directly. Uh, so I, I think it's just important that, you know, again, it's, these are psalms that we recite quite regularly. Uh, but it's good to take a moment to think about what we're doing and how these themes uh, interact with them. And so, I, I, I don't know, I, fi I find these things really, really worthwhile. One thing, one thing that I actually found challenging but also beneficial from learning the book of Psalms, and with this I'll close, is that it's a little tricky. Prayer is prayer and learning is learning, and they're not the same thing. You, as, like everybody during prayer, if all they were distracted by was Torah learning thoughts, that wouldn't really be so bad. Uh, usually distractions are, are, are of other varieties, of all different kinds. Uh, if everybody were distracted by learning, okay, it could be worse, right? Uh, that said, it, do, it does interfere with prayer. One thing that's tricky about learning the Psalms is then going back and being able to still pray them. The goal of, of, of the book and, and of everything that I do in the, in the book of Psalms is to take a moment to actually learn them and then go back and try to pray better because now you actually understand what you are saying and connecting to the central themes of what they are trying to do. So I hope, I, I thank you really all for coming. I thank the Institute for, for making all of this work possible. Uh, we're going to turn it over to my father, but before we do, I just want to remind everybody at the end, there are books at the back table. I think they are $15 each or two for 25, except for my hardcover book. If you want the long lasting thing on your shelf, that I think costs 25 each. And, and so you can make checks to the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals or keep it simple and write, I, J, I, I, and hope the bank believes us. <laughs> but that actually does work. It's a lot fewer letters. Uh, and, 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 and that all being said, thank you so much again for coming. Uh, my father is going to introduce his book, which really represents some of the crown jewels of his scholarship. And I look forward to hearing your presentation on that. Thank you very much. What a great pleasure it is to speak at the same conference with my own son. When, I, when he was just born, he was already smarter than me. He's, we played chess. By the age of 12, he always beat me. But Chaim, is, uh, as, even as a youngster, he used to teach classes in Sherath Israel, and he went on to teach at Yeshiva. It's magnificent. And you should certainly buy his book, and, but you can buy mine too. It's okay. But I want to make an extra plug. The extra plug is that buy a Hanukkah presents. We're almost at Hanukkah. We have a nice salesman back there, Dr. James Nussbaum, and uh, we hope that you'll do that. Okay, and I want to thank also all of you for being here. Thank Rabbi Robinson, Lincoln Square Synagogue, and especially want to thank to the Sephardic Publication Foundation, whose president is here, Dr. Jane Mushabak, and the, and the entire board for helping in the publication of this volume. Years ago, I was reading a book by Dr. Oliver Sacks, great neurosurgeon, one of the most brilliant writers, thinkers. And he had a patient who was autistic, young, young teenager. And the teenager uh, came to the doctor's office, and the doctor wanted to test what are his skills. So he took a little jigsaw puzzle, and he put it out on the table with many, many pieces. And he told the boy, please put the pieces together. And within two seconds, boop, 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 the kid put together the puzzle perfectly. So Dr. Sachs, being a very wise man, 
took all the pieces apart, put them all upside down. But there's no picture. And he said, could you put that together? Whoop, 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 just as fast. He put the whole thing together. When I read that, I said, you know, there is a sermon in that. How is it possible to take all the pieces and put them all together, but not see the picture? The answer is it's possible. It's possible to focus on details and even focus on them correctly and put all the pieces together correctly, but still miss the overall picture. Let's talk about Judaism. We look about the Jewish people. We have Orthodox and Conservative and Reform and Reconstructionist and Renewal and Haredi and Hasidic, pro-Zionist, less pro-Zionist, Jews in the Israel, Jews in the Gola. We all love each other, right? The small people, and we have so many factions. And if you ask any one of us, each one of us is right. Each one of us has the piece of a puzzle and is absolutely sure our puzzle is right. We see it right, everyone sees it not as correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, stand back. There's a picture that has to be made. When God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai, it wasn't pieces of puzzles that are supposed to be understood separately. There was a picture, there was an, Im an image, a vision of what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to be. The Torah tells us we're supposed to be Am Kadosh, Mamlechet Kohanim, holy nation, nation of priests. But what does it all mean? Actually, the greatest idealists in the world are the Jewish people. Because in spite of all the negatives and all the problems, we're basically optimistic people. We always believe the Mashiach will come. There will be salvation. There will be a whole picture. And what is the whole picture? There's going to be a time when all the people of the world will see one God, recognize one God, will recognize we're all brothers and sisters, will live in harmony and tranquility. Way out there. If you look at reality, we're not anywhere near that yet. But we have faith. We're going to get there. Now, I and I have my cousin Abraham here. We both grew up in Seattle, Washington. Rabbi, rabbi Maimon, Abraham Maimon's father, was a rabbi in the Sephardic synagogue Bikucholim, for many, many years, and his grandfather as well. We grew up in the, I call it the old country. The old country, our parents were born in Seattle, but our grandparents came from Turkey and from the island of Rhodes. Spanish-speaking, Ladino-speaking people. We grew up in a community that in those days was maybe 12,000 Jews. Now Seattle has about 60 or 70,000 Jews. But in those days, a very small community. And most of the people were Ashkenazim. And most of the people were not Orthodox. When we grew up, beautiful family, beautiful home, everything happy and beautiful, except when we went to school. When we went to school, we somehow learned that there's something wrong with us. We weren't mainstream. When there was food to be served for Hanukkah, it was latkes. We ate burmuelos. We didn't eat latkes. When they taught us the tune for reading the Torah, it was a different tune from the one that we used in our synagogues. When they taught us the prayers, it was different prayers. We said them differently. We had different words, different pronunciation, different music. Everything that we learned in school was a negation of who we were. But we had strong family, strong synagogues, and we felt comfortable. I came to Yeshiva University. And I remember this was 1963, a long time ago. So we had a class in Halakha. And the teachers told us, among other things, when the father says Kiddush, you're not allowed to say Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. That's called an interruption. You just say Amen. Sounds like a trivial point. I raise my hand. Excuse me, in our home, we do say Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. And the rabbi answered without any hesitation, your family does it wrong. We do it wrong? All right. Do it wrong. So that Pesach, that year for Pesach, I came back to Seattle. I told my father, we can't say Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo anymore, Kiddush. He said, why not? My, my teacher in school taught us we're not allowed to say it or consider it a hefsek, it interrupts a prayer. But my father said, but the great rabbis in Rhodes and Turkey, they all said Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. We said it, Papu said it, my grandfather, we all say it. Dad, 
you're spending a lot of money for me to go to yeshiva. So we stopped saying it. Very trivial thing, but not trivial. What he's basically saying is, I can no longer trust who I was. I can no longer trust my family. I can no longer trust, trust all the traditions. 1992, my father died in 1991. 1992, we were in Israel, and I was at a bookstore, and I bought a book called Minhagei Achida, the collection of Minhagim of Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai. And he just discusses as follows. Minhag ha'ulam la'anot baruch hu baruch shemo. The general custom is that you should say baruch hu baruch shemo kishe omrim kishe shom'in az karvat Hashem. Gam divracha shiv se bab yedecho hatam kegom kiddush havdalah, etc. He says the general custom is to say baruch hu baruch shemo when you hear the person say kiddush. The ein mochim liyadam. You're not supposed to stop him from doing that. The commentary was written by Rabbi Ruven Amar. He said, not only is the custom permissible, but you should do it that way. Rabbi, <coughs> Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Chalayim Palachi, in his book, one of his books, he says, <laughs> before the man says Kiddush, he should remind the people to say Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. He tells them specifically, he also says, this Rabbi Amar says, Rabbi Israel Abu Chatserah, when he used to have people at his house for Friday night, if they didn't say, Abu if they didn't say Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo, he didn't feed them. <laughs> he told them, you must say it. So, son of a gun. Here I had a custom, which was a perfectly good custom, which I made my father change. And now if my father was gone, I couldn't go back and tell him and apologize. What's the story about? The story is about pieces of a puzzle and not seeing a whole picture. Very often, each of us has a tradition. Either we were born into it, or we learned it, or we adopted it. It could be Sephardic, Ashkenazic, different kinds of Sephardic, different kinds of Ashkenazic. And we think, that's it. What would have happened if the teacher would have told me, oh, interesting, Mark Angel. I never heard that the custom was to say Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. Go ask your father, ask your uncle, go find out. And I will do some more homework also. It's interesting to learn that there are different customs. Now, I'm going to give one other nightmare story, then I'll get to some better stuff. One of my friends, close friends, was getting married. And he asked me to be a witness on the ketuvah. OK. Very nice honor. So we go to the wedding. And when it came time to do the signing, the Rosh Hashiva, his Rosh Hashiva was a man from YU, big long white beard. I won't say his name. He's in the next world. Anyway, he was being the Sadir Kiddushin. He was the officiating. So before I could sign the Kiddushin, he said, sign your name on a, on a blank piece of paper. So I put Mordechai Ben Chaim Angel. He said, what's that last word? Angel, angel, it's my name. He says, without any hinting, without any blinking his eye, Jews don't have last names. I said, I'm a Sephardic Jew. Sephardim have last names. He looked so far, he says, Jews do not have last names. Puzzle. He pushes me aside. There were 200 people there. All my classmates, my friends. I turned white, I was going to faint. Because I have a last name, I wasn't a Jew, I wasn't able to sign a ketuvah. Whoa. Next day, I go to the president of yeshiva. Well, he's an old man. He didn't mean any harm. What do you mean he didn't mean any harm? He's negating who I am. He embarrassed me in the public. Enough is enough with that. What I'm getting at is this. In his mind, he had a piece of the puzzle. And in his mind, he was entirely correct. For him, Jews don't have last names. But he couldn't open his eyes and realize there's a much bigger picture. There's a bigger picture. There's not one kind of Jew. There's not one kind of tradition. We are multi a multiplicity of people. We are a multipli multiplicity of traditions. Now, sometimes when I was a younger fellow, I was very ethnic. I was very strong, pro-Sephardic in every which way. Whenever I could open my mouth about Sephardism, I was there. As I got older and wiser, I started to think more carefully. I also was looking at pieces of a puzzle. I don't want to see pieces of the puzzle. I want to see a whole picture. I want to see a whole Jewish people. 
What can I, so I started to imagine, what's going to happen 100 years from now? Our great-great-grandchildren, will they care if they're Sephardic or Ashkenazic or Syrian or Moroccan or Hungarian? Will they care 100 years from now? I don't think they're going to care. I also don't think they're going to care if they're Orthodox, Conservative, or Reform. I think all those things are going to dissipate. What do we want 100 years from now? We want our great-great-grandchildren to be good Jews, solid, confident, wonderful Jewish people. But for them to be wonderful and confident, we want them to be able to draw on the best of all of our traditions. We're not interested in promoting an ethnicity. That's why I named my book Sephardim, Ethnic Sephardim, but I call it Sephardism. Sephardism doesn't belong to Sephardim genetically. It belongs to all the Jewish people. Hasidim belong to me too. The Shalom Aleichem belongs to me too. Yiddish literature belongs to me too. It belongs to all of us. Just like the Jewish people are made up of a multiple number of pieces, all those pieces belong to every one of us, whether we like it or not sometimes. But we belong to all, all of those things belong to us. So the goal is not to promote an ethnic Judaism. The idea is to promote a Judaism that's broad enough to look at a whole picture and to be inclusive. So I'm trying to think. I've written many, many things. I'm not going to give you a whole litany today. But just touch on a few, a few points. One of the things that the, uh, well, let me just start with the halakhic part. One of the people that have done a lot of work on Sephardic halakha is Tzvi Zohar, Professor Zohar in Bar Ilan University and the Shalom Hartman Institute. He's a good friend of mine. He's done wonderful work. And he came to the following conclusion in a number of his books. What's the difference in Sephardic halakha and Ashkenazic halakha? I'm talking very generally here. The difference was that in the, 19, in the 1800s, the Ashkenazim in Europe, the Orthodox Ashkenazim, had to deal with a tremendous phenomenon called reform. They were dealing with Reform Judaism, the rise of Reform Judaism. Jews were getting rights in Western Europe. And even in Eastern Europe, where they weren't getting so many rights, they were, ideas were percolating. Ideas were percolating. And with the rise of reform and the rise of secularism, the Orthodox rabbinate decided all we can do is tighten the reins, build higher walls. It's us, the good guys, and them, the bad guys. So there are many of the, of the great chachamim of those days who basically took a position of we're under battle, we're being embattled, let's build high walls to protect ourselves. We don't want anyone to assimilate, we don't want anyone to acculturate. We are the true Jews, who are the true Jews? Those who keep them as vote. And those who don't keep them as vote or don't keep them like we do, they're outside of the camp. In one of his articles, Adam Furzinger, Furzinger who also teaches at Bar-Ilan, made the interesting observation. In 1800, most of the Jews of the world were Shomrei Shabbat in 1800. In 1900, most of the Jews of the world were not Shomer Shabbat. In one century, there was like a radical change in all of Jewish life. We often don't think of how powerful that change was. So what are you supposed to do? You're a rabbi, a traditionalist in the communities where things are changing so fast. How are you going to stop it? They're the bad guys. Don't change. Don't marry them. Don't have anything to do with them. If someone wants to convert to Judaism, make it as hard as possible because we don't want anyone to uh, go to the, uh, because why? Because th they define Judaism as keeping all of the mitzvot. That was in Europe. In Muslim countries, they didn't have reform. It wasn't that they were unaware of reform. In, the, in North Africa and Turkey, they were also, besides, the, we often think of them as simple communities, they also were very sophisticated. Very, very sophisticated people and very knowledgeable. And we have to remember, that many of the countries in North Africa were under colonial rule. The Jews had, they knew European languages. They knew French, they knew Spanish. They were, knew Arabic. That wasn't a European language, but they knew it because they lived there. They, they were aware of the intellectual currents, but they weren't, didn't have reform. So even though not everyone was as pious as they should be, the rabbis didn't feel a need to build high walls. They, they made room. Life isn't perfect. There was another great genius of the Sephardic communities. They didn't split into reform or conservative or reform or any other movement or, or orthodox. There was Judaism. 
Judaism was, we keep Shabbat, we keep kasher, we follow the rules. And if individuals veered away from that, there were individuals. But the community, they never thought the community should change itself. They always maintained itself as a whole. So there was a certain, it was done not out of a lack of thinking, it was done precisely for the opposite reason. It was done because they thought carefully. It was not healthy for the picture of Judaism to split into various tribes, into various uh, subsets. We want to promote Judaism in full, the whole Torah, all the misfot, but we recognize that everyone's there, and we try to make room for everybody. In our community in Seattle, there were people who were very pious, very wonderful people, and there were people who were less pious. They used to drive to synagogue on Shabbat. And no one ever said, boo. No one said, you're good, you're bad. You don't get naliyah, you get naliyah. There was kind of an acceptance. Not that I shouldn't, the word acceptance is the wrong word. It wasn't, we're in favor of, we accept breaking violation, but it was a way of looking the other way. That's also a philosophy. Looking the other way is also a philosophy. But there's a philosophy that's intending to build a community. So this division between Eastern European Ashkenazic thinking and North African or Turkish thinking is relevant. It's not, you can't uh, apply it every single case, but it represents trends. In 1970, the uh, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef came to New York to speak. Rabbi Maimon, your father was there. We were, there we were together. My uncle was there with, with me. Oh, you were there? You were a kid. You were just a kid. So uh, Rabbi, Ovadia, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef gave a, a shiur. And in shiur, he said that the Sephardim tend to the principle of chesed, or compassionate, and Eskenazim veer to the quality of givura, heroism. They're strict. And we're in the, we belong to Bet Hillel. We're very more liberal, more, more chesed. I'm not saying that that's true in every case. I'm not saying it's true in every case. But I am saying that if a rabbi starts with that assumption, it affects the way you think. If I, I, if I grew up thinking that Judaism is tolerant and open and, and kind and inclusive, that's going to affect the way I make my sakalacha also. And if I grew up thinking that everyone who doesn't keep his is bad and evil and doesn't get a mitzvah, doesn't get, can't call, call to, get called to the Torah, that also will affect how I'm going to make halakhic decisions. We're not free of our, of our own past. I'm going to give a, one a little example. I'll give you two little examples. I'll give you three little examples <laughs> of, of what I call the Haver Ha'ir. There's, a concept, there's different names that rabbis are known by. One of them is called Haver Ha'ir, which is my favorite title. Haver Ha'ir means literally the friend of the city. Technically speaking, Haver was somebody who's very punctilious in ritual things. But generally taken, it meant Haver Ha'ir was someone who was loving, someone who cared about the people. So let me give an example. In 1968, before I was a rabbi, I was still in rabbinical school, Gilda and I, we got married in 67. And 68, we traveled to Europe and to Turkey and to Israel for the first time. And when we were in Istanbul, we spent some time, we had Shabbat with Rabbi Nisim Bahar, Allah wa shalom. Rabbi Nisim Bahar says, you come to my house for Shabbat, but come on Friday, Friday morning. We come to his house on Friday morning. And he says, we're going to come with me shopping. Okay. He stops at one store, he buys some onions. He goes to another store, he buys some carrots and apples. He goes to another store and he buys some potatoes. I said, Rabbi Bihar, why are we going to all these places? You could buy all those things in one store. This todos son judios. All of these people are Jews. They have to know the rabbi cares about their parnasah. The rabbi cares that they should earn a living. They should know that the rabbi supports them. Ooh, I was a young rabbi. I wasn't even a rabbi then. I was Erev Rav. <laughs> you, you got it. But it was a letter of impression. Here's a chaver ha'ir. When you're a rabbi, you're not aloof from the people. You're not sitting in the Beit Midrash all day. You care that people are making a living, and they have to see that you care that you're making a living. When I was a young rabbi at Sherath Israel, not too far from here, so uh, there's many organizations, sisterhoods and women's division, I don't know how many, how many organizations there were. And they want the rabbi to come to these meetings. And I'm going crazy. I'm 24, 25, 26. I have to go to these meetings and committee meetings. 
See, Chaim got smart. He left the business. He, he, he left the rabbi. He just sucked at teaching. But I, I was a synagogue rabbi. So I went to my teacher then, Chacham Gaon, blessed memory, Shlomo Gaon. And Chacham Gaon, you have to help me. I have to, these people want me to go to all these meetings, and I want to sit down and learn. I want to write. I have to research. I have to prepare shiurim. I don't have time to go to all these meetings. I thought Chacham Gaon would say, what a wonderful young rabbi. I'm very proud of you. He didn't. He says, you know, I'm ashamed of you. What? You're my teacher. We're very close. He says, you know, when these people go to these meetings, they're giving their time. They're raising money for charity. They're trying to help the synagogue. They need to see the rabbi cares. And you think you should just sit down and learn? You think that they, they don't get anything from you being there? You should be there and show that you're part of the community. If you're not there, that's a failing in your rabbinate. Leave the rabbinate. Don't be a rabbi anymore. But if you don't believe in the people and don't spend time with them, then you're going to be a failure as a rabbi. A rabbi, it's a tough profession. I can, I can tell you about it. If I had to do it again, I would do it again. Beautiful. But you have to learn. People come first. You have needs. Of course you have needs. You have responsibilities. You have family. Yes, all those things are important. But the kahal has to come first. If the kahal doesn't come first, you shouldn't be, you should be driving a taxi cab instead. Do something else. That's not for you. So this book that I wrote, is, there's only one article that's really brand new. All the other articles are a collection of things I've been writing since the 1970s. And actually this is Kenahara, to use an Ashkenazic word, right? This is actually my 40th book. Yeah, 40th book that I've written or edited. So uh, yeah, it's a special, special occasion. But the important thing of this book isn't that I, they're all brilliant articles, which of course they are. But what's important is there's a, an attempt to show a whole picture. I want all the Jewish people 100 years from now to be able to talk about the Baal Shem Tov and Levi Yitzchak of Ardichiv. And at the same time, I want them to know Yiddish literature, Ladino literature, Arabic literature. I want them to know that there's a, tr a vast tradition that part that, that constitutes the Jewish people, not just one thing. I want to take all those little pieces of the puzzle and put them together. And if we realize all this diversity is actually amazing, can you think of any other people in the world? You could go to Book of Responsa, written by a rabbi from the island of Rhodes, written from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, from Hungary, from Morocco, from, from Tatuan, from Tangiers, and they all have the same foundation. They all talk the same language. They all base themselves on the same Torah. They argue with each other, they have differences of opinion, but the foundations are the same. It's an amazing thing. The Jewish people are absolutely a phenomenon. This last week, we are reminded how vulnerable we are, unfortunately, even here in Manhattan. We realize there are people who don't like us necessarily, we don't, they don't even know who we are. And they're ready to kill us. But we also know not something else. Ha'ikar lo lafachid. The important thing is we should be concerned, but never afraid. The Jewish people never is afraid. We have confidence, ultimately, that this whole picture is not just a picture for the Jewish people. It's a picture for humanity, a picture of peace, of understanding. OK, so please, if you have questions or comments for either of us, we have a few minutes. And then please um, take advantage of the wonderful books back there. Chaim and I will be glad to sign. And they're $15 each, two for 25. We'll give you a bargain in honor of Hanukkah. And buy extra copies you could bring to give us Hanukkah presents. <laughs>